We're going to spend the next few lectures talking about rare events. To begin, let's go back to the strong law of large numbers. This limit theorem says that if I have a sequence, xn, of iid integrable random variables, then their empirical average converges almost surely to their common mean. Now, almost sure convergence implies convergence in probability, so we can also rephrase this as the weaker, weak law of large numbers, although before we only proved that in the case of L2 random variables, and of course it now holds also for L1 random variables. But let's go back to the stronger L2 assumption. For the weak law of large numbers, we had a concentration result with a quantitative bound. If the xn were iid random variables and were assumed to be in L2, then we showed by a simple application of Chebyshev's inequality that the concentration of the empirical average about the common mean was of order 1 over n as n grows. This gives us some quantitative information about how rare this event is, the event that the empirical average differs from the common mean by at least some positive number, epsilon. But how rare is that event really? The answer to that can be complicated depending on how irregular the random variables xn are. So to dispense with pathologies, let's actually assume that they're extremely regular. We're going to work for the next few lectures with exponentially integrable random variables. Those are random variables for which this quantity, the expected value of any exponential of the absolute value of x with some parameter t, is finite. Now, notice that for any t positive, the exponential of e to the t absolute value of a number x is eventually, that is for large x, larger than x to the power p for any positive t and p. And so that means that exponentially integrable random variables are in Lp for every p greater than or equal to 1. If you want to keep in your mind an example of such a random variable, you could take bounded random variables, they're exponentially integrable, and of course Gaussian random variables. Anything with strictly sub-exponential tails for its distribution will be exponentially integrable. We're going to work towards understanding precisely how rare this event is when the underlying distribution is assumed to be exponentially integrable. To get there, let's remind ourselves of an analytical tool that helps to understand distributions of exponentially integrable random variables, the moment generating function. Harking back to lecture 10.1, we introduced the moment generating function of an exponentially integrable random variable as such. Now, in fact, we don't need fully exponentially integrable random variables to define this function. We only need exponential integrability for t sufficiently close to zero. Then this will define a nice function on an interval around zero, which captures all the information of the distribution. But for the sake of our arguments in this discussion of rare events, we are going to assume that the moment generating function is indeed finite on the full real line. Now in that case, going back to arguments that we made in the lecture about differentiating under an integral, we know that the moment generating function is actually analytic. It has a convergent power series on the full real line. And we can compute that just by expanding the power series for the exponential and find this power series expansion. In other words, it is the convergent Taylor series whose Taylor series coefficients at zero are the moments of the random variable, hence the name moment generating function. And let's just note that if we expand the first few of those, we have one plus the mean times t plus one half the second moment times t squared, etc. Now, since we start with a one here, that means that at least for small t, we can take the log of this function. But also, we know that this function is strictly positive for all t. And so by analytic continuation arguments, the log is also a nice analytic function for all t. We'll call that log moment generating function, which I'm denoting by psi, the cumulant generating function. This is somewhat old fashioned terminology, but it does have statistical meaning. If I take the log moment generating function and I expand it as a power series about zero, well, 
because I have a one in the start for the moment generating function, the zero degree coefficient for the cumulative generating function is zero. And so this power series starts at t to the one. Let's let ck denote the derivatives of this function at zero, so that this is its Taylor series expansion. Well, we can certainly use calculus to differentiate this. The first derivative of this log is the derivative of m divided by m. And evaluating that at zero, we get the first moment in the numerator and one in the denominator. So the first cumulant, c1, is just the mean. How about the second cumulant? Well, we can differentiate this function twice. That gives us m double prime times m minus m prime squared divided by m squared. And if we evaluate that at zero, we get this expression here. That means we have the second moment of x minus the first moment squared divided by one, which is of course the variance of x, which is a more statistically meaningful number than just the second moment. In general, it's not hard to see that the kth cumulant is a degree k polynomial in the moments up to order k. Some of the higher ones have their own names that you'll find in statistics literature. The third cumulant C3 is called the skewness. In the same way that the variance tells us about how spread out the distribution is, skewness tells us about whether it's skewed to the positive side or the negative side. The fourth cumulant is called kurtosis. If you like, you can work out a formula for it. It's a sum of five terms involving the first four moments of the distribution. And there are some graphical representations of what it's supposed to mean in terms of whether the distribution is tall and skinny or short and wide. We will not have a lot of use for these combinatorial constructs for higher k. In this course, I will mention that in some areas of probability that relate more to non-commutative geometry and analysis, cumulants are perhaps the only effective tool in understanding some extensions of probability theory. But we're lucky to have more powerful tools at our disposal. We're going to use this cumulant generating function, the log of the moment generating function, to really pin down exactly how rare events related to the strong law of large numbers are. So that's our goal, to understand how rare this event is. In the case where the underlying distribution is exponentially integrable, let's center things as usual. We'll let x circ denote xn minus its mean, and sn circ denote the sum of the centered random variables, which is just sn minus n times the common mean. So the probability of the event that the empirical average differs from the common mean by more than epsilon is the same as the probability that the centered sn is bigger than n times epsilon in absolute value. And let's get rid of those absolute value bars that can only increase the probability since this event is contained in this event. And we're going to study this probability. How rare is this event? Well, we're going to make the following observation. The exponential function is increasing. And so if I choose any positive parameter t, sn being bigger than n epsilon is the same as e to the t s n being bigger than e to the t n epsilon. Now I'm going to apply Markov's inequality with this as the random variable. I can do that because the exponential integrability assumption will tell us that this random variable has finite expectation. Indeed, the Sn is a sum of independent terms, each of which is exponentially integrable. And so the expected value of this will be the product of those finite expectation values. Now let's expand that product just as we said. E to the Tsn is the product of e to the txk circ, and by their independence, the expected value will factor as the product of the expected values. Of course, they're all identically distributed, and so all of those terms are the same. They're all equal to the moment generating function of any one of the variables at t, and therefore their product is that moment generating function to the nth power.
Thus, the probability of the rare event in question is bounded above by the nth power of this exponential product. Now, let's write the moment generating function as the exponential of its log. Its log is the cumulant generating function here. And that just allows us to combine everything into a single exponential like this. And so the end result is that the probability of this event is bounded above by e to the minus n times some constant. And we can choose t freely here. So the upshot is, if there's ever a t for which this is a strictly positive number, this event is so rare that the probability is exponentially small in n. Well, it turns out that this quantity here is in fact always non-negative and will for sure be strictly positive, at least for a large epsilon. Let's explore how that works now. We're going to delve a little bit into the mathematical physics world and talk about the Legendre transform. If psi is any convex function from reals to reals, its Legendre transform, psi star, is defined like this, which is closely related to what we saw on the last slide. That is, for each real number eta, psi star of eta is defined to be the supremal value attained by eta times t minus psi of t over all real numbers t. Let's look at one example. Suppose that our convex function is this quadratic function with a fairly arbitrary positive constant out front here. I write it this way because, as you can calculate from a nice Gaussian integration, this is the cumulant generating function of a normal distribution with variance sigma squared. So let's compute the Legendre transform. We need to take the supremum of this affine transformation of psi. So that means just the maximum value of this quadratic function, where eta is fixed and t is varying. This is, of course, a downward opening parabola. And so it will attain a unique maximum. And that maximum will be at the unique stationary point. Well, that stationary point can be computed from calculus. And it occurs at t is equal to eta over sigma squared. And if we plug that value in for t, we get that the maximum value attained is 1 over 2 sigma squared times eta squared. So that is the Legendre transform here. Notice, by the way, that this, by the same argument, is the cumulant generating function of a normal random variable whose variance is 1 over sigma squared. So there's a nice duality there, which in fact carries over in general in the following sense. Here's a proposition. If psi is any convex function, then psi star, its Legendre transform, is also a convex function, which means that you can take its Legendre transform again. And in fact, the Legendre transform of the Legendre transform is the original function. The proof of that is basically some calculus, which is a little laborious and not too interesting. We're not going to use this fact, but it's useful for us to keep in the back of our minds. But here's an addendum. If the psi is the kind of psi we're interested in, the cumulant generating function of a centered, exponentially integrable random variable, then the Legendre transform is a non-negative function for non-negative arguments. And in fact, that supremum, which defines it, which is supposed to be a supremum over the whole real line, can be restricted to be a supremum over only positive t. So let's prove that part of this proposition. This is again just going to be calculus, but it will require some clever probabilistic intuition, which will be relevant to our arguments going forward. Psi, in this case, is an analytic function. So it's certainly twice differentiable, and convex, therefore, just means that its second derivative is positive. So let's compute that second derivative, like we did earlier. This is the log moment generating function, and so this derivative is equal to this expression here. Now let's write this in terms of the moment generating function. We can differentiate under the integral sign for the moment generating function, which is e to the tx, inside the expectation. And so its derivatives are the expectation of the powers of x 
e to the tx. And so this simplifies as follows. Now, why am I calculating this second derivative? Well, if we're going to calculate the Legendre transform of this thing, which, from the previous slide, we really do want to do, it had better be a convex function from what I've written here. So I really want to show that this second derivative is non-negative on the real line. To see that, we're going to use a nice trick, a change of measure. Our random variable is defined on a probability space with respect to some probability measure p. What we're going to do is introduce a new probability measure that has a density with respect to that old one as follows. The density of the new measure, pt, is e to the tx divided by the expected value of e to the tx. That's designed to still be a probability measure because if I take the integral of this, I'm going to get the moment generating function on the top divided by the moment generating function on the bottom, giving me one. And of course, this is a non-negative measurable function. Now, the reason to do this is that we can bring this mx inside and couple it with the e to the tx, just as we can here inside this quadratic term. And so we can rewrite the expression here as the integral of x squared against dpt minus the integral of x dpt squared, which is, of course, the variance with respect to this changed probability measure of the random variable x centered. But variances are always non-negative. So by changing measure, we can construe this second derivative as a variance. And that shows that psi is indeed a convex function. Now, we'd like to show that its Legendre transform is non-negative on the positive real line. And the way to show that is, again, from some simple calculus. Let's calculate the derivative of the cumulant generating function at zero. Well, we've already done that. The first cumulant is just the expected value. But we've centered our random variable. And so that shows that the first derivative at zero is zero. So we have a convex function which has a critical point at zero. That means it must look like this. And at zero, where it achieves this critical point, the value psi x naught is zero. And so that shows that the function stays above zero everywhere. Well, that means that this quantity that we're interested in eta t minus psi is negative when eta is greater than zero and t is less than or equal to zero because this will be a negative number and this will be a non-positive number. So this function, which is also zero at zero, is negative for negative t. But since we know the function does attain at least the value zero at zero, it follows that the supremum of that function will be non-negative and achieved with t greater than or equal to zero, which is what we wanted to show. So now that we've got that basic calculus out of the way, let's return to our calculations around rare events in the strong law of large numbers. We show that the probability of this rare event, that the centered sum is bigger than n times epsilon, is bounded above by e to the minus n times this quantity for any t. And so therefore, it's less than or equal to this quantity where the t maximizes that non-negative number. We now know that that is a non-negative number because we recognize that what we have here is an upper bound by e to the minus n times the Legendre transform of the cumulant generating function at epsilon. And we've shown that this constant inside here is non-negative. Now, could it be zero? Well, it could in principle be zero for sufficiently small epsilon. But suppose that it was zero for all epsilon. That means that the Legendre transform is just the zero function. And since the Legendre transform is an involution, that means we know what the original cumulant generating function had to be. It's the Legendre transform of zero. You can quickly calculate that the Legendre transform of zero is uniformly infinite on the positive real line, which is inconsistent with our assumption that the random variable is exponentially integrable to start with. And so we actually know that this thing is strictly greater than zero for all large enough epsilon.
And so we have indeed shown that this rare event is exponentially rare in n, at least for epsilon sufficiently large. Now let's write that in the following form. If I take this probability and take its logarithm and divide by n, what we've shown is that the limb soup of this logarithmic rescaled quantity is less than or equal to this value here, which is a strictly negative number for sufficiently large epsilon. That's one neat way of saying that this is an exponentially unlikely event. But is it really exponentially unlikely, or is it even more unlikely than that? We've only proved an upper bound here. It turns out that this is also sharp. And that's the theorem that we were aiming for. Due to Swedish mathematician Harald Kramer, this is the first large deviation theorem. If I have a sequence of IID exponentially integrable random variables, then this event that the centered sum is bigger than n times epsilon for any epsilon is indeed precisely exponentially small. If I take its log and divide by exactly n, then the limit of this quantity is exactly equal to the negative of the Legendre transform of the underlying center distribution at that parameter epsilon, which is a non-positive number that is strictly negative for all large epsilon. That is exactly how rare this event is. We have proved the upper bound part of this theorem, and in the next lecture we will prove the lower bound part. But let me just conclude this lecture by saying that this is the first example of what is now called a large deviations principle. If we have a family of events, or better yet, a family of probability measures that concentrate at least exponentially fast, we talk about those exponentially small probability events as large deviations from normal events. In modern parlance, we would say that the family of probability measures, that is the laws of the centered empirical averages, satisfies a large deviation principle where the rate function is this. And the rate, which is an exponential rate in this case, is linear n. We will have the opportunity to see at least one more large deviation principle later in this course. In fact, another one related to a different form of the strong law of large numbers. Generally speaking, whenever you have a limit theorem, there will be a large deviation principle associated to it. And the large deviation rate functions often carry a lot of fine-grained information about both the distributions and the structure of the limit theorems. In this case, it was the cumulant generating function. In a case we'll see later, the notion of entropy will arise naturally from a large deviation principle.